Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be deriving the Bernoulli equation. Once again, we're going to be looking at a differential fluid element, but unlike in fluid statics, now we're interested in an element that is moving. So we need to give this a velocity. I'm just going to think about velocity in the x direction. In reality, this thing could be moving in any direction. And what we're going to do with this fluid element is look at conservation of energy. We're going to be focusing on the potential energy and the kinetic energy. The potential energy is based on gravity. So I'm going to say that this distance here is y, which means that the potential energy is going to be the mass, delta m, of our differential element multiplied by gravity multiplied by the distance y from our reference point. The kinetic energy here is going to be the standard 1 half times the mass times the velocity squared. This is how we're defining our energy for this fluid element. What we need to do next is look at the conservation of energy equation. And all this says is that the energy at some state 1 plus whatever work is done from state 1 to state 2 is going to be equal to the energy of state 2. Now it's easy to have confusion about this work, but this is the work done on the element. So now a reminder, work is simply the force multiplied by the distance in the direction that the force is occurring. We're interested in the total work from 1 to 2. So the way that we're going to write this is we're going to say that this is the integral from some position x1 to some position x2 of the force multiplied by dx. So that way, if the force changes over time, then we can keep track of that over the movement. We now need a position x that indicates how far along our particle is in the x direction. And since we're tracking the distance between these two states, we're actually interested in where this will be at some later point. So we're gonna have two x values, one that we're gonna call x1 that deals with the state one, and one at x2 sometime in the future. So between these two points, the position is obviously changing, but the velocity and the height and the pressure could all be changing as well. So now let's talk a little bit about this force. Remember, once again, the force is just going to be equal to the pressure times the area of whatever surface it's pressing against. We're going to think about pressure acting on each of these surfaces, though because we're only interested in the force in the direction of motion, we're really only going to track the pressures on the left and right hand sides. The pressure on the left side is going to be P, while the pressure on the right side is going to be P plus dP dx times this delta x. So the total force here is going to end up being the integral from x1 to x2 of the pressure times delta y delta z minus this other pressure, again multiplied by delta y delta z, all of that integrated in x. So now we have defined what's going on with the potential energy, kinetic energy, and the work done. So we can write this out for both states. For state one, the potential energy is just going to be delta m g y1. The kinetic energy is going to be one half delta m v1 squared. And then I can copy out all of this work that's done and that's going to be equal to the energy for state 2. All that's left is the simplification of this integral. So we can get rid of the p's, which means that we end up with just a negative dp dx multiplied by the volume, which we can take out of the integral. Keep in mind that this delta m is going to be equal to rho times delta x delta y delta z, so we can actually get rid of all of the deltas here as well then these delta m's just become rows, and this gets much simpler. So let's rewrite that now. We can use the fundamental theorem of calculus in order to 
rewrite this as negative p2 minus p1. So we end up with rho g y1 plus one half rho v1 squared plus p1. And that's going to be equal to the exact same for state two. Another way of saying this is that for any state, if we're tracking this fluid particle, this is going to end up being constant. So we can say that rho g y plus one half rho v squared plus p is a constant. This term right here is exactly gamma. And we can simplify this out a little bit simply by dividing through by gamma. And the reason we want to do that is that gets this equation in terms of just a unit of meters. It's just height that we're dealing with. And height is a much easier thing to think about and to measure than pressure is directly. So if we write this divided through by gamma, it becomes a statement about the pressure head of a particle as it travels through a flow field. And we didn't do the full derivation here, but this is true for more directions than just straight to the right. We can be moving in any direction and follow any path with our particle, and this still holds true. Now, what I didn't mention before is that this only holds true for ideal flow. And what I mean by that is that there can't be any friction in our flow. Because if there were friction forces on our element, that would mean that there's an additional force that we didn't account for, and that would do work on our element as well. So we'll be using this equation for a lot of ideal analysis of pipes, and later we'll add in what we call head loss, which will account for this friction that we're neglecting right now.